So hello everyone. Dear students, thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar on the future of air travel. When the first motorized aircraft took off in 1903, no one could imagine that around 100 years later, over 45 million commercial flights would be operated each year. What brought us here were the groundbreaking technological innovations of the aircraft industry. Today, the industry is dominated by two large aircraft manufacturers, namely Boeing and Airbus. In this slide, we are honored to have Grazia Vitadini, CTO of Airbus, with us as our guest speaker today. Ms. Vitadini was born in Italy and raised in the US. She began her career as part of the Eurofighter Consortium before joining Airbus in Germany in 2002. Moving into more senior management positions at Airbus, Grazia was executive vice president and head of engineering at Airbus Defense and Space. In May 2008, she became chief technology officer, leading Airbus' ambition to pioneer sustainable aviation. As such, she is the first woman in the Airbus committee, executive committee. Dear ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me, Grazia Vitadini. Thank you so much, Clara, for the, for the warm welcome and the very kind introduction. It is uh, such an honor for me to be among all of you this morning. I, I don't often have the opportunity to speak to students in a, in a venue such as uh, this one. So I'm really um, looking forward to exchanging with and learning from you all today. I was, uh, well, really hoping to be able to join you physically for the uh, speaker series. And well, in fact, I'm dialing in from my home just a couple of hundred meters away from you. Uh, but well, instead, our local contact uh, restrictions have uh, kind of relegated us right to interacting in 2D, um, sitting either physically distanced from uh, one another or in our own homes or offices. Well, indeed, we, we do see the many blessings of living in a digital age, especially, I think, for all of you, right, in the student and the academic communities as curricula and studies transition to virtual and, and online platforms. But we cannot deny that the pandemic has left disruption in its path, despite how productive these digital tools uh, may be. Higher education institutions such as the TUM are not only real monoliths for curricula, they're literally cultural hubs bringing together individuals from nations around around the world. And while in Tomb's case, these individuals, uh, I, I understand, represent one third of the whole student population. Well, unfortunately, we've seen the rapid spread of the coronavirus significantly deteriorating this rich ecosystem of human exchange and learning. Travel restrictions and border closings have either canceled or cut short study abroad programs, and in more unfortunate cases, sent international students back to their home countries, leaving groups of friends and peers fragmented in the process. Well, on a macro level, these circumstances have uh, prompted literally a global standstill of air travel unlike we have ever seen before as you can imagine our industry the aviation industry has been really gutted by this crisis 94.4 percent now that's the drop in passenger traffic we saw in april 2020 in comparison um, to figures of the previous year and at the same time, however, well, I'm well aware that air travel may not be an industry everyone believes in 
and that's okay. And perhaps even some of you in this virtual room today are part of that demographic, and that's okay too. But just let me share a number with you. 272 million. This is how many people reside outside of their birth countries. For these people, aviation provides a connection to one of the things that matters most, home. Many more of our fellow earthlings belong to the demographic living in remote parts of the world. And to them, air travel is not a luxury. Air travel is often the only link to necessary supplies, to reaching their loved ones and reaching out to the rest of the world. Not only this, but aviation safeguards global stability by uniting us across borders. Much of the peer-to-peer -peer learning and dialogue exchange I, I alluded to earlier would simply not exist without aviation. In this respect, I truly believe that flying makes us realize that we are part of something which is greater than ourselves. And if you want to have a look at it from a more quantitative viewpoint, well, then just consider, please, that measured by value, one third of global trade is transported by air. And above this, above all, this goes for valuable goods and services like medicine and humanitarian response. And soon, very soon, we hope perhaps even the new coronavirus vaccine. Aviation contributes a staggering 3.5 trillion American dollars to worldwide GDP, without which 4.8 million jobs are at risk. So you see how a lot is at stake without the recovery of our industry. Now I understand that today you'd like to hear my answer to a very uh, pertinent question. What does the future hold for your industry, for the aviation industry? And let's face it, it can be that the real question some of you may, may be wondering is, you know, with the pandemic painting such a bleak picture for air travel, is aviation really still committed to climate action? Or, uh, you know, will you rather focus on getting uh, profitable again as soon as you can? Now here, I wanna be very clear and very candid with you, dear students. This is a false choice. Already before the crisis, it had become a widely accepted view that preserving our climate, preserving our environment is the indispensable foundation upon which to build the future of our industry, ecologically and economically, societally and politically. I firmly believe that there won't be any industry profit at all without climate protection. And what the coronavirus did was to dial up the urgency for a healthy environment. We're all aware of that. So at Airbus, we are not only convinced a green recovery of our industry is non-negotiable, but in addition to that, we have accelerated our ambition into a very tangible plan to bring a zero emission aircraft to market by 2035. Zero E, which we unveiled very recently, is a crucial element to this plan. Now, what is um, zero E? Zero E is the, the sum of uh, three concept aircraft. 
which have a common denominator as they all rely on hydrogen as a primary power source. Exploring different technology pathways and different um, configurations, architectures. While we do find hydrogen to be a very promising technology pathway on our pursuit of climate neutral flight, it must be um, clear that there is no silver bullet solution to decarbonizing the skies. Uh, we need to work on many different dimensions and, and pull many levers to get there. This means basically connecting experts from different fields to exchange ex expertise and, and learn from each other. We're talking about technologies which are not exclusive to our industry, right? So we need to bring in expertise from other industries. We need to continue with data and intelligence gathering. We need to um, explore several technology pathways, such as, for instance, um, alternative fuels, sustainable aviation fuels. We need to look into alternative propulsion, electric, hybrid electric propulsion. And we also need to rethink the material side of our products, relying more and more on smart materials that, for instance, react to environmental conditions and that are fully recyclable end to end. And of course, um, as fundamental enabler, we need to continue drawing upon groundbreaking fields like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and even quantum technologies and quantum computing in particular. Now, shaping the future of air travel is not just all about technologies. It also means that we will need to take better care to harness the talents of truly everyone. Because if we miss out on diversifying, well, we're missing out on the precious talents of more than half the planet's population. This is something we simply cannot afford. So if we return now to the essential question, what does the future hold for the aviation industry? Well, if you had asked me this before the pandemic, I probably would have replied, well, um, climate neutral, a world in which maybe even Greta Thunberg uh, will, will fly, a world brimming with ingenuity, a world um, whose skies welcome more and more autonomous and silent aircraft made of smart and recyclable materials, a world embracing inclusion, a world in which our industry's leading companies would have an executive board hailing from all corners of the world. Well, how does my response sound today? My response is no different. We still have one planet. So let's work together to protect it from further degradation. Our society and planet still needs us to harness our collective ingenuity and progress in the name of real science. And we still hold to what we can to embrace everyone's unique characteristics and perspectives they bring to the table. Now, being today in the presence of young innovators, researchers, and academics like yourselves gives me absolutely great optimism for shaping collectively this future. So let's come together and let's deliver a world that is not only brimming with technological and societal breakthroughs, but a world which is better than today's. Thank you so much for, for having me today. I look forward to discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vitalini, for this inspiring keynote. It really sounds like we have a great time ahead of us in aviation with many more important technologies to come. Uh, so before starting with the moderated session, I want to encourage our audience to um, 
think about questions they would like to ask you, Ms. Vitadini, and um, post them in the chat on the right side of the screen. And um, you can do that during the whole moderated session, or you can also upload uh, questions that have been already posted if you're interested in them. Um, yeah, and they will be answered in the Q&A part later. So, Ms. Vitadini, um, you touched upon um, the topic um, of zero carbon emissions in your keynote. And as you said, it is your declared business goal at Airbus to develop the first zero carbon emission um, aircraft by 2035. Can you specify once again, what are the most promising new technologies uh, to replace fossil fuels? So indeed, I mentioned 2035 as objective, um, and this is incredibly ambitious, but our conviction is, is really strong. So we, um, to get there, to get there in time, this means that by 2025, we're going to need to uh, select specific technologies and, and architectures, and in parallel to continue advancing many, many technology solutions at once. So this is not just visioneering, this is not just the conceptual aircraft you've seen uh, on the slide earlier on. There's a really very uh, tangible uh, set of roadmaps, technology roadmaps and demonstrators to take us there uh, to de-risk um, significant uh, development, significant uh, uh, parameters such as the ones related to refueling an aircraft um, uh, based on flying on, on hydrogen. How do you store? How do you store liquid hydrogen? How do you distribute it in an aircraft? So. We have a set of, of roadmaps with demonstrators to de-risk all the factors uh, I mentioned and many more just to make sure that we stick to our commitment, which is first and utmost uh, put safety above all what we do. So we have demonstrators in the pipeline and I count already getting, starting to get some significant results mid next year. Um, it's not just Airbus, right? We're not on our own. The challenge is such that no industry, uh, no company, no nation will make it on their own. So we need indeed to contribute um, to an industry global goal and endeavor to tackle climate change. We're gonna need to spearhead a united front, um, joining forces and focusing all our resources with the stakeholders around the industry, the political arena, uh, but also universities, research institutions. This is the only way to really reap the shared benefit that the, uh, 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 technology revolution such as hydrogen for uh, aviation could bring. So we want to accelerate. We want to accelerate our transition to renewable energy by really proving the feasibility from technical viewpoint, from operational and commercial viewpoint as well uh, of, of such a, such a new, uh, new approach. Now, you've, you mentioned Clara also, um, uh, you, you asked uh, about promising new technologies to to replace um, fossil fuels. So, as um, as I highlighted before, we're moving on a number of different technology um, pathways, um, and we need to rely on the convergence of these technologies. We can't put everything on just one um, development. Now, sustainable aviation fuels and electric flight have, uh, we've been working on these, um, on these pathways already since some time now, and uh, with a lot of demonstrators, um, we've been flying um, an urban uh, mobility platform in the United States, Bahana. Uh, we have uh, been working on our EFANX demonstrator, and we've learned a lot through these uh, specific um, projects and they have really laid down um, some of the groundwork for climate neutral um, aviation. 
And um, in all our assessments and analysis, hydrogen has definitely emerged for us as a clear uh, game changer because it ticks all the right boxes. It's, uh, it's safe, it's lightweight, it's storable um, as either compressed gas or uh, liquid. It has a very high energy density. It's uh, three times higher than, than uh, fossil phase jet uh, kerosene. Um, okay, it has uh, four times the volume, so that does pose some uh, some uh, challenges when it comes to designing um, an aircraft. Um, and yet, again, it is um, a way uh, hydrogen emits no CO2 emissions when burned. Um, the byproducts are water and, and vapor. And this fact uh, alone uh, really did prompt us to, to focus uh, our resources on, on this specific pathway. Really interesting, okay. And um, SCTO, you also try to keep the overview over the whole business and the entire value chain. Um, so other than in the aircraft engine, where do you see the greatest potential for Airbus to reduce carbon emissions? Um, well, indeed, Clara, if, if, if decarbonizing our industry would be just a matter of engine a propulsive uh, efficiency, well, that would be an easy feat. Um, so a global transition to, to uh, carbon uh, neutrality requires a rethink of, of several elements of, of the whole ecosystem beyond just the propulsive part of it, right? So if you, um, if you take hydrogen, for instance, again, as an example, it's not just the aircraft. Um, well, we're gonna need to, uh, to see an entire uh, technical redesign of, of, our, of our aircraft, of course, but we're gonna need to mobilize airports infrastructure as well. We've started working already with, uh, with airlines and, and airports on the concept of having airport hydrogen hubs um, and uh, with a plan to really develop a stepped uh, approach, including the idea of using hydrogen to decarbonize also all airport associated um, ground transport. So think of heavy, uh, the trucking industry, um, uh, tow trucks, buses, heavy goods logistics. And this could happen in the 2020 to 2030 um, time frame, and this will pave the way um, to hydrogen availability in the time frame I mentioned before. So in the 2030s, and let's not forget that there are already um, airports around the world, such as Heathrow, Berlin, and uh, Los Angeles, who have introduced already hydrogen fueling stations for their ground support and transport um, vehicles, right? So this is uh, the infrastructural topic is, is absolutely a fundamental one. Um, let's not forget the aviation authorities uh, component as well, right? Um, uh, safety first, always. This means that no matter what type of novelty we bring onto our uh, flying platforms, well, that eventually will need to be certified and we will never uh, bring anything onto our products, uh, which will uh, reduce our safety standards. So they need to stay at ISO level, if not improve. And the aviation authorities um, will, will, will play a significant role into making sure that we do develop uh, our new technologies along that uh, line of thinking. And uh, while well, government collaboration is also a critical piece um, of the puzzle. Uh, France and Germany recently uh, announced uh, state support to fund R&T uh, into this uh, specific, uh, very ambitious uh, topic. And I'm absolutely convinced that Europe can really play a leading role in the transition to decarbonized aviation. And let's not forget one last point that I'm talking about hydrogen, but that's gonna have to be green hydrogen, right? So 
more than 90% of hydrogen currently in use across all industry is gray. It's not sustainably, it's not produced sustainably. So um, uh, switching to, to green hydrogen at an affordable cost uh, will require uh, really a very uh, concurrent and coherent and synergetic um, approach from all stakeholders. I mentioned the industry, different industries, uh, oil and gas, the energy industry, uh, plus of course, um, the governmental and institutional component, which is a fundamental enabler. Great, okay. And um, as mentioned in your keynote as well, you are drawing up on um, groundbreaking fields like quantum computing, topic in which many of our listeners are really interested in, I think. Um, so how far can quantum computing impact aviation? Well, uh, when it comes to quantum, we're really um, quantum technologies as a whole, because it's not only computing, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's computing, it's quantum comms, communications, um, and, um, and it's sensing as well, right? Uh, but indeed, I'd say quantum computing is the, uh, is the area where we're um, most advanced. Uh, together with comms as well, but quantum computing specifically is a field where uh, we've recognized um, an incredible uh, potential to deal with uh, complex optimization problems, which are typical of our um, of our of our industry when it comes to, for instance, uh, designing an aircraft. So. Um, We've been experimenting quite a bit, thanks also to uh, partnerships with, uh, with startups um, who gave us uh, the means to, um, to, to work with, uh, with quantum annealers. And um, we've, uh, we've tried uh, different, uh, different applications. Some worked uh, well, some less. So we did uh, learn also on uh, in terms of where you know would would it make sense to apply it uh, going forward, and we also realized um, very soon that you know we are not uh, quantum scientists. We get the um, we at Airbus absolutely understand the potential of this technology, but if we really want to progress, we need to harness on the collective intelligence and all the wisdom of, uh, of quantum experts worldwide. And indeed, uh, we have uh, recently uh, launched a quantum computing challenge where we reached out to the uh, vast um, quantum um, computing expert uh, uh, world out there, uh, really posing some typical challenges, questions, uh, which we have to solve when uh, developing an aircraft or when, um, yes, optimizing an aircraft. We um, have uh, posed questions related to optimization of uh, load on board an aircraft, optimization of routes, of climb, climb uh, a phase into um, a, a typical you know, flight uh, sequence. And most interestingly, there is um, a, an aspect when you design an aircraft, which is particularly challenging, and that is getting the wing box right. Now, the wing box is that component which ensures, uh, to say it in absolutely not scientific terms, that the, um, the wings remain attached to the fuselage and, and do um, uh, fulfill their, their task of um, uh, generating sufficient lift. Um, so it is an incredibly interesting component because um, it is dimensioned and optimized based on a myriad of parameters. It needs to be as lightweight as possible. That is our, uh, let's say, one of the key criteria for resin aviation. But it also needs to um, leave space for the systems, the cablings and the pipes which would run through it uh, across the fuselage. 
it needs to um, enable to take uh, different type of, uh, of loads, right? So it's the flex of the wing, it's the torsion, um, it's the uh, pressure uh, uh, loads coming from the fuselage. So it's an extremely complicated component to, uh, to optimize. And so we've reached out also with this challenge to the quantum community out there um, based on our Airbus quantum challenge um, quantum computing challenge framework. And we were blown away by the results we did uh, get from the scientific um, community out there in terms of translating this typical physical problems into quantum uh, language and quantum statements. So we were absolutely blown away by the very different approaches the scientific community took all across the world. So many, um, so many uh, interesting, absolutely interesting uh, proposals, and it, it really we had a we had quite a hard time. We had to call in a panel of uh, of worldwide um, quantum uh, specialists, professors, and researchers to really help us um, sort out the, um, uh, the 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 winners. And uh, well, there will be more um, on this uh, to come, so stay tuned as uh, the challenge is definitely reaching its final phases. We definitely will. Thank you for that. Um, great. And you often touched already on the safety standards of your industry. So um, when launching a new product, it is essential for you to meet these uh, safety standards. Does that sometimes slow down your innovation process or even prevents you from pursuing promising ideas? Um, <laughs> Well, um, it, it may definitely, and you know this was also it, it's a comment I often I often make when seeing um, the 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 vast uh, <laughs> uh, landscape of urban air mobility platforms being uh, proposed out there. You know, just go on uh, on social media, go on YouTube, you'll see hundreds hundreds of uh, of platforms demonstrating um, their flight capabilities and autonomy well that's fantastic um, yet once these platforms will need to carry passengers commercially well um, we are by no means ready to compromise not even a bit on the safety standards which our industry has reached in the course of uh, of uh, of years and years of uh, of experience. So it's it's easier said than done. And um, yet, if you need to take more time to make sure that the elements of novelty you're introducing on an aircraft are by no means affecting. Uh, its safety standards, then we will take the time. Uh, it's nothing you can uh, you can uh, you can rush into. Um, and again, it's a history of uh, of, of aviation. Um, you know, has uh, there's some some painful learnings in the 100 years, 100 plus years since the Wright brothers flew. And every single one of these um, painful uh, accidents has brought significant lessons learned, uh, which have been um, not always easy to implement into our products. But that's absolutely where the also uh, economical interest uh, is, is, uh, takes a second position. Um, safety is, is first, always. Good to hear as a passenger view. I think that's, that's what makes the difference in the end. <laughs> okay, and um, what about um, uh, supersonic aircraft? So since the Concorde retired in 2003, there haven't been any commercial supersonic flights. Do you think there will be a revival of these passenger jets in the future? Well, um, Concorde was absolutely a marvel of, of its time. And if I have one regret is that I never got to fly on the Concorde. Uh, but, um, you know, 
the fact is there was at that time no no viable business case behind it so um, there was no way at that time to operate a supersonic passenger aircraft efficiently um, now i'm i'm an aerodynamicist originally so uh, you know supersonic hypersonic <laughs> Um, aerodynamics is definitely something uh, which warms my heart. Yet, um, let's be frank, how do you reconcile this? How could we reconcile this with our um, uh, environmental ambitions and, and targets? And emissions are not only CO2 emission, we're also talking about noise. So if there would be a way to reconcile renewable fuel, alternative propulsion sources, um, uh, sound uh, reduction, if not cancellation uh, devices on a supersonic aircraft, well, I'll be, I'll be all in. As of today, we at Airbus have the skills to, to design um, supersonic aircraft uh, beyond the Concorde, let's not forget our defense um, division of course with a Eurofighter and tornado before it uh, has these uh, these skills um, yet i do not see in the uh, commercial civil uh, field how uh, we could possibly reconcile this with our environmental target yes that, that makes sense there and now let us turn to an issue that all students of the technical subject are quite familiar with um, the low proportion of women um, what, into your mind, can be done to attract more females to study men's subjects and thus increase the number of women in technical industries? Well, it's really no secret, right, that the, um, the aerospace sector isn't exactly diverse when it comes to gender. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a systemic issue. I think in all engineering based um, companies and it will be a long term effort, but we definitely need to catalyze that change. Now, um, at Airbus, we, we absolutely uh, were convinced that our responsibility towards our employees, but also towards society are absolutely closely um, interlinked. So, who and how we we attract, promote and develop uh, resources is not only a key business imperative, it is absolutely necessary if you want to have a sustainable impact. So that's why not only diversity, which means you have the right to sit around the table, uh, but also inclusion which means you have the right to have a voice. And beyond that, belonging, your voice is heard. Uh, these concepts have been long been at the heart of our company values, right? Um, so it, how to make that happen? That's no, um, that's no, no easy, no easy, uh, no easy challenge. And again, it can be tricky to focus only on um, gender. I, I really dream of the day, I understand where that comes from, okay, but I dream of the day where we're going to be able to do away with describing me as the only aviation industry um, woman CTO or you know the, the 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 first woman to serve on the executive committee board that day will when we will when that day will come it will mean that we really um, that it became normal to see variants on the standard format and <laughs> team huh? so it will mean that true equality will will be reached finally in my specific case, being the uh, only uh, CTO woman uh, among uh, other men, I don't find that fully describes me. 
I'm usually the only one in the room being an Italian national, US raised, uh, pentalingual, an aerospace engineer with an ATPL license, uh, pilot license with the classical ballet training. Now, this is a multifaceted background that does differentiate me. And as a result, I, I tend to, you know, it, it's not um, strange for, for me to go against the grain when it comes to offering perspectives. Um, and simply put, if we do not make um, a, a concerted effort to get more women, yes, but also more uh, minorities into science, technology, engineering, mathematics, we're just missing out again, I said it before, on the talents of more than half the population. We cannot afford this. And it's just not just a matter of being kind, uh, right, to, 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 to diverse uh, uh, people. It, it, it's, it's a matter of, of survival. Now, I mentioned more than once our mantra, safety first, safety first. Now, just think of having around a table um, engineers coming all from the same school with the same, um, same gender, uh, same cultural background, same nationality, uh, same ethnical background, um, same uh, uh, sexual orientation, they will think alike. They will, it is highly likely that they will think in unison, right? And when you um, consider new technological developments and you wanna make sure that again, you do not affect these safety standards we've set, um, you want to have people constantly challenging the concept, asking different questions from different perspectives. So it's not just a matter, again, of being able to say, hey, we're diverse or, you know, we are kind and we accept everyone. No, it's a matter, again, of, of survival and making sure that the solutions you develop are robust and safe. And this is, I believe, what has made Airbus unique from its very beginning, uh, 50 plus years ago. Um, different uh, different uh, national industries coming together and uh, bringing to market a product which, uh, you know, the first, uh, when the pioneers, the fathers of, of Airbus said, we're going to do a wide body twin engine aircraft and it will go across the ocean. I mean, uh, you know, the Americans were saying, yeah, okay, come back once you've done that. <laughs> And guess what? That's what we did. Uh, that's what we did. Harnessing on uh, on the competencies of the whole um, German, French, um, UK, and and Spanish um, industry on the history and the competence on the difference of perspectives, and that's how the A300 was born five, uh, 50, 50 years ago, right? So it's not just a matter of ticking boxes. It's a matter of survival, of being competitive and even profitable. There's a bunch of studies out there demonstrating that true diversity is, is the key to make companies more profitable. Sounds like you're in a good way <laughs> to, to reach this new normality. So um, how would you describe your own leadership style? And in what ways do you think it might uh, defer to that of your male colleagues or to, to that of different ethnicities? Um, <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, there's different um, aspects which make me uh, who I am, right? And um, I am a true uh, believer that empowering um, who you have around you, uh, agreeing on a common goal, but then letting them run with it is absolutely a key to um, performance, high performance within a team and, uh, and, uh, and the, the best way to deliver to your commitments. Now, um, 
I've changed quite a few positions uh, in in my in my career path, and at a certain point, you know, I stopped being the person who uh, knew best. What what is it that we were talking about, right? So um, as you uh, grow and and uh, acquire more and more responsibilities. Well, you need to cope with the fact that very often you will be dealing with um, with topics, with problems where you are the least qualified person to talk about it. OK, and this is absolutely OK. So I like to think that a distinctive trait um, in my style is to highly rely on the best possible people. I, I, I could attract to work in my team or without my team or uh, outside my team. Uh, in or out, it doesn't matter. We have incredible experts um, all across our, our company. And for me, it is really um, fundamental to be able to rely on this expertise to uh, advise me whenever there's uh, uh, significant decisions um, to, be, uh, to be taken. And this applies to technologies, but also to um, human uh, resources. Whenever I recruit within my team, I always make sure that um, other colleagues also have a say and uh, interview uh, candidates so that at the end, together, from we assess candidates from different uh, perspectives. And uh, typically, and this is something many find uh, amusing, I would also ask um, my assistants to, to have a say. And um, often you see, well, it has happened, you know, that very skilled, very um, qualified um, candidates would go in and out of my office without even, you know, introducing themselves to the assistants. And, uh, uh, and this is for me a parameter which already, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of how how well uh, what what type of, of team player is is this person? So um, I truly harness on everyone's expertise and diversity to get to results, and it is sometimes a pain in the neck. <laughs> Let me be very explicit on this one because managing diversity. Is not easy. Um, it's not easy because you, as a leader, need to constantly adapt. Different uh, colleagues with different uh, characteristics also need different management styles. So you need to stay authentic. You are who you are, but you need to use the different facets of your personality depending on who you are um, interacting with in order really to enable them to uh, to do what they can do best and um, and sometimes you know you get into endless discussions because there's different perspectives and you would like to say oh gosh can we please now converge um, and there's always a bit of uh, chaos uh, and a component to it uh, in the creative process which seems chaotic to those who are used to manage by command and commanding and controlling, but that's absolutely worth it. It's, uh, it's something which at the end really brings to a fantastic, creative, unique, and robust, sustainable solution. Really interesting insight here. So with that, we have finished the moderated part and come to the Q&A session to address the question from the audience. Um, so thank you, first of all, to all the students sending in questions. Uh, the first question is, um, what is your opinion on flying taxis like Lilium, for example? You know Lilium? Oh, I know. I, I, know, asked before. Lilium okay. well. uh, I know Lilium very well. I know Daniel. I know the colleagues, uh, the colleagues, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the very the incredible engineers um, mm -hmm. working um, on Lilium. And um, well, I, and by the way, there's also quite a few uh, former Airbus colleagues uh, joining um, Lilium and uh, 
uh, so my my regards <laughs> uh, to to all ex uh, Airbusians now on the Lilium uh, uh, adventure. Well, there are a few um, urban air mobility um, platforms and projects, most notably Lilium and Volocopter, um, who um, well, which are really progressing, in my view, on a sound uh, development path. So um, currently with demonstrators, um, which will probably not be one-to-one uh, -one what the commercial um, platforms will, will look like, right? So um, I do follow with a lot of interest the, the progresses of, uh, of both. And um, I find them absolutely very promising developments. And I would love uh, to have them coming over to, you know, in Ottobrunn, um, close to Munich, where uh, my, my main um, office is. We do have a, um, a fantastic uh, testing facility. Our EAS, Electrical Aircraft System House, it's, um, it's a facility we have set up with the intent to test on ground um, alternative uh, propulsive uh, concepts, so fully from fully electrical to hybrid electrical concepts. We have all what it takes to go up to two megawatt of, uh, of uh, electrical power. And um, I'd be absolutely delighted to, um, to, be open, to, to be able to open this uh, facility also to third party uh, usage and uh, in this sense, but they know it because I've told them already. So Lilium and Volocopter are very welcome to join us on site Otto Brunn, where by the way, uh, TUM now has also a new, uh, uh, established a, a presence with a new, uh, new faculty. And this is something we're absolutely delighted uh, with and look very much forward to making the whole, uh, the whole site really a very vibrant, even more vibrant um, place where uh, different ecosystems uh, collaborate jointly. Great, maybe some of them are listening right now, so <laughs> they feel addressed. And um, how far is the Chinese competition already, would you think, and how is it changing the market perspective for Airbus? Uh, this is a very, this is a very, um, very good question. Mm, well, uh, we monitor, of course, also what what Comac is uh, is up to, and um, well, de definitely, I'm sure there will be a point in the future where um, you know, most likely, you you've spoken about the duopoly. Uh, uh, when you introduced me, it it could become uh, indeed um, a matter, a game for three players and not just for two. So we do not exclude uh, we do not exclude that. Uh, this said, well, um, we don't just monitor the Chinese ecosystem; we are part of it. Airbus is at home in China with the final assembly lines for our single ale, uh, with uh, also um, helicopter final assembly lines, with um, innovation centers, right? So um, I do have an outpost in Shenzhen where um, uh, colleagues from, um, so uh, Chinese colleagues jointly with the European colleagues do develop innovative solutions, so more short term um, with respect to the research and technology type of time horizon, supporting, um, um, for instance, manufacturing and the industry. Um, having final assembly lines in China, um, a copy paste of our, for instance, Hamburg uh, assembly line, running at a rate which is lower than the European um, rate enables us to test their innovative uh, solutions when it comes to um, logistics, optimization of manufacturing flows, um, 
also um, based on uh, on um, on artificial uh, intelligence uh, algorithms. We can test it there and then bring it back to Europe uh, without uh, you know a perturbation of higher manufacturing rates. So we are definitely um, at at home in uh, in China and are. Uh, looking also to possibly uh, reinforce our presence over there. Okay, and uh, the next question is, do you think we will see a comeback of an A380 size aircraft in the next 10 to 20 years? Ah, <laughs> oh, the A380. That was my first aircraft at, uh, at Airbus, you know, when I, when I joined Airbus back in 2002. I was um, actually, I developed a solution for the, the window frames of, uh, of the A380 um, out of composite material. Now, currently the A380 has a metallic solution and I, was, uh, I developed a um, composite solution, which at the end was not adopted on the A380, but it was on the A350. So this is also um, for me, a demonstration of the fact that sometimes technologies are just not ready at a certain point in time, but, uh, you know, um, never say never. And the same, you know, applies also to uh, to the A380, where uh, what is the, <laughs> why, why um, uh, did we have to take the decision we took? It is our customers tell us that it's quite complicated to fly profitably the A380, unless you are Emirates having um, uh, hundreds, in, uh, more than a hundred in your fleet. It's very complicated to, um, to fly it profitably, coping with um, load factors. So uh, passengers on board below a hundred percent. Um, in addition to that, I believe uh, the era of uh, four-engined aircraft may have come to an end. For operators, um, it's very costly to fly on four-engined aircraft, which need to be, again, the safety standard I mentioned uh, before, to be regularly inspected and overhauled. We have seen some, um, the, the most recent developments on, on, on engine uh, uh, concepts and architectures and configurations going more and more into high bypass ratio type of, uh, of configurations allow us to um, fly even um, very long haul on two engines. They are much more uh, performant and fuel efficient than the, uh, the type of, um, of, of technology uh, flying on the A380. Just consider that every time we come out to the market with a new um, aircraft, um, or a new version like the A320 uh, and A321 NEO, new engine option, we improve the fuel burn. Uh, so we reduce fuel burn and as a consequence, we reduce emissions by a, let's say um, 25% compared to the previous um, uh, comparable uh, model. So 20, 25% minimum. And um, uh, really flying on four engines has become uh, not affordable for, for our customers. And therefore um, we, uh, we will stop uh, producing um, A380s. Um, but again, all the learnings of it, a whole generation of, uh, of Airbus engineers has been trained on the on the A380, and a lot of the lessons learned have already been implemented on the A350. And so it will be a continuous. Nothing is lost forever. Huh? It will be a continuous uh, improvement uh, uh, type of approach, which we will seamlessly take into our new aircraft. That sounds good. 
And uh, now the last question, due to the current situation, I, I would say. Um, so it says the planes which will fly for the next 10 to 15 years are already being made. What is your re view on also retrofitting current aircraft to be more sustainable? So um, this is a very good question. And um, indeed, well, in this key, you need to interpret also the governmental help being given to airlines in the sense of supporting our customers to renew their fleets. That's not only Airbus, it's also the competition profiting from this, okay? It's um, based on what I said earlier in the sense of reducing significantly the emission. Uh, already, um, changing the fleet to the highest um, and newest technology standards currently available in the market contributes already um, to, to uh, uh, emissions reductions. So this is exactly in the sense of the question being posed. That's how you need to understand the, uh, the, the, the possible um, support given from governments to airlines. Um, beyond this, definitely it will take some time before all the fleets out there um, fly on um, alternative um, solutions such as hydrogen, right? And this is one of the reasons why I am being so vocal around the topic of sustainable aviation fuels. This is um, a common uh, denominator for the chief technology officers of, um, of the whole industry, including the competition. Uh, and this is a topic uh, on which uh, we, we do exchange a lot across the whole industry. We've taken some bold commitments at the last uh, Paris um, air show um, and we will be uh, speaking again as one um, in the next uh, weeks to really uh, motivate the oil and gas industry, the energy sector, the regulatory key players in terms of um, certification bodies, but also ICAO, um, ATAG, uh, which does also regroup um, our customers or representative of our customers, we need to mobilize the whole um, ecosystem to really um, start thinking uh, sustainable aviation fuels made out of sustainable uh, constituents such as green hydrogen. Um, you combine hydrogen and CO2 and with the a lot of electric energy, which needs to be uh, also green, you produce uh, drop-in kerosene, um, which um, if you look at the current uh, uh, levels of scale is five times as expensive as, uh, as a fossil fuel-based kerosene. Now, of course, uh, there will be a scaling effect to bring this down. There must be pricing and regulatory frameworks set up in order to enable us to go there. But this is absolutely a, um, in my view, it's not an option. It's the way we have to go in order to enable, uh, again, the, uh, the current uh, state-of-the-art technology to fly more sustainably and um, especially when it comes to, uh, to long range aircraft. That really gives hope for the future, I, I would say. So with that, we already come to the end of this webinar. We hope that you all enjoyed it and uh, drew many inspirations from it. Many thanks to you, Ms. Vitalini, for taking your time and sharing so many insights with us today. It is great to see how much passion you put into the future of aviation. And we wish you and Airbus all the best for the future and are excited for the next groundbreaking innovation to come. Thank you very much, Clara. Thank you, dear students. It was a pleasure. 
having the opportunity to interact with all of you. Stay safe and stay healthy and remain optimistic, please. Take care. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.